We are talking about the impact of COVID-19 on, on our higher education system, but, but more importantly, uh, broadly society, and what does that mean for us um, as engaged universities? I'm really excited and happy to be joined by a formidable panel of speakers um, and led by Professor Croatia Abdul Karim, who is based at UKZN and also associated and affiliated with Columbia University. Professor uh, Linda Ronnie from the University of Cape Town. And then also joining us from New York today, Professor Tabor Morja. So happy to have you and thanks again. Uh, we deeply appreciate um, your, your commitment to us and to agreeing to participate in this exciting event. So it's really good um, to have you and we look forward to, to your engagements and your presentations and your input. Um, for those of you who may not know, um, the Engage platform is really there for us. Uh, we, we invite uh, speakers of note to come and, and talk to us about um, a relevant topic and the topic today being around COVID-19, as I mentioned. But this is just one of uh, the many uh, uh, components of the Higher Education Leadership and Management Program. If you want to know more about Helm, suggest you please visit uh, and sign up uh, at our website at www.helm.ac.za. And just uh, another, because I'm the Chief Marketing Officer uh, too at Helm, just to remind you our next uh, Engage event uh, number three, which will be on the 28th of September, will be on student success. So those of you involved, you're all involved in the success of our students who are core focus in, in, in the university sector. So please uh, keep an eye on the notification and the registration uh, for that event. Um, but other than that, we, we really are excited to have you here today. And I'd like to now hand over to our program director and our moderator uh, for the day, Dr. Birgit Schreiber. Over to you, Bright Birgit. Enjoy the event. And I look forward to a really exciting and robust engagement today. Thank you very much, Birgit. Thank you, Oliver. Um, it's great to be here. And we're excited to be in the second um, Helm Engage event. Just a few housekeeping issues. Um, we have three speakers, so we're switching cameras and screens. So please be patient in between. You know, sometimes there's a moment of silence when we switch. Uh, please be patient with that. We have backups for everyone, um, for the speakers. So if something should fail, we can back up and run the slides. We are, of course, recording the event. You can see the event or send on the event if you want to review it or send it to somebody else. We will have copies on the YouTube channel, on the Helm YouTube channel. We have three speakers, 20 minutes each, some questions and answers in between, and we will have an evaluation right at the end, which we hope you will fill in. It's a very brief one, quickly. Um, we appreciate your feedback. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you um, Professor Koresha Abdul Karim who is an infectious disease epidemiologist, is Associate Scientific Director at Caprisa, Professor in Clinical Epidemiology at Columbia University in New York, Pro Vice Chancellor for African Health at UKZN, and the UNAIDS Special Ambassador for Adolescents and HIV. She's a formidable speaker and researcher and academic, and um, Professor Croatia, we are so honored to have you here. We look forward to your presentation. Um, um, Croatia, we can't hear you. You need to unmute. Uh -huh. Okay, go. too many things. You caught on. I'm a real technophobe. I know. <laughs> so I thought I had everything very, one more minute you before you go on. Karesha, one more minute. I'm going to ask our tech people to um, spotlight you so that you are in the camera. There you are. Perfect. Got you. You can start. Okay. 
Good. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to start by thanking uh, Birgit and Oliver for the invitation to uh, be part of this very exciting webinar uh, this afternoon by the intriguing title of The Good, The Bad and The Ingenious. And I will talk about the social impact of COVID-19, the good, the bad, and, uh, and some opportunities for building better. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, I'm trying to advance my slide. It's uh, also wonderful to have this opportunity to share this uh, panel with Professors Rani and Moshe. And um, I am not sure why my slides are not advancing. So I'm just gonna stop share and then go back to... Uh, trying again. That's great. We can see the screen. I just need to get it into presentation. Mm. Oops. Okay, so uh, I think that should do it. Uh, just by way of outline, what I will do is just give you a quick um, glimpse of the current status of the pandemic. And then I'll uh, dwell on a few examples of the good, the bad, and then conclude with some opportunities that we have on how to build back better and stronger. So I think, you know, two years ago or um, in, in January 2020, when, uh, when we started the year, I don't think any of us anticipated how our worlds would change. Um, and we had some indication of a new epidemic uh, in the Wuhan province in China. And very, very quickly thereafter, we uh, saw the rapid spread of COVID-19. Actually, we saw the spread of the virus, SARS-CoV-2, and then we started to get a better sense, one, of the speed of the spread of the virus, and two, um, in terms of the impact, uh, the small proportion of people who were getting infected uh, and developing severe disease um, were being hospitalized, and, and some really uh, scary pictures and sobering pictures of unfolding epidemics in Italy and in, uh, in, the New, in New York City. And I think uh, in South Africa, we, we're starting to plan for this. But as we stand a few days ago, 214 million cases and 4.4 million deaths. Just a reminder that uh, this, while sometimes uh, we are in Africa or South Africa or wherever we are, and we think this is just a challenge that we're facing, uh, this is really a global uh, challenge. And you can see, you know, um, the start of the pandemic on the left side of this uh, figure, and and then this very rapid increase, a very prolonged first wave, a bit of respite around February 2021, and then we see the uptick again, and then a bit of respite around June, July, and then the start of a third wave. So what was happening in Africa? In Africa, we have 7.6 million um, infections, which is about 3.4% of global cases, but the disproportionate burden of deaths, we account for about 4.1% uh, of global deaths uh, in about 15% of the global population. But again, you see very similar trends of um, uh, first surge, uh, second, and then currently this third surge. And very significantly in Africa, what we see is an increasing severity every time we have a surge. And you can see from 13.6 million cases during the first surge, 
to 31.1 in the current, and we're far from over from the third wave. Again, looking at the figure of Africa, what you see is some countries bearing a disproportionate burden. And in fact, about five or six countries in Africa account for about 65% of all of the infections that we are seeing in um, Africa at this point in time. Turning to South Africa, we see this very clean three waves. We see uh, the start of the pandemic in, um, in early March. Uh, some of the national lockdown slowing the spread. And then as the national lockdown was lifted, uh, we start to see this rapid increase peaking and then uh, a sort of uh, 100, 120 day trough. And then we have the second surge and then currently we're seeing this third surge of infections. And I wanted to share the provincial data with you because like the differences that we're seeing um, in terms of the continent um, in, within South Africa, we also have a diversity of epidemics. And as you see here, not to read all the fine print, but for each of the provinces, we're seeing very different, um, a, a very different surges unfolding. And while you know um, the sort of surge in the first wave was very similar, we saw in the Western Cape not really coming down. And then in the second surge, we saw really severe um, uh, surges in the Eastern Cape, KZN and the Western Cape. And then with the current surge, I think um, we all still reeling from this uh, incredibly uh, high surge that Kauteng experienced um, in this current wave. And you can see many provinces still uh, continuing to see rises and not yet having reached peak, some coming down, etc. So the long and short of it is that we don't in dealing with this complexity of surges between provinces, we don't have a sing single and simple solution. And we've got to really understand our, uh, our unfolding epidemic. And as these waves come and go, what does that mean for each province and how do we respond accordingly? And I think the question on all of our minds is, how much longer will this go down? And, it, and honestly, when I heard about the Delta variant, like that was for me a real, um, you know, wow, I, you know, this can't go on anymore. Well, there's a lot of hope and I'll talk a little bit about the hope that we have, but the truth is that this virus is gonna be with us um, for a long time and that um, the vaccines offer us some hope and, uh, and, and what we have to start looking at is how do we start to rebuild and do recovery plans and, and, and live with the virus. And I think it's very likely given the trends we've seen so far that we will see a fourth wave. When that will happen, your guess is as good as mine. Um, if it follows the days in between the different waves, we're anticipating something in late um, November, early December, but don't hold me to this because it's also dependent on the emergence of various of, uh, variants of concern that, um, that uh, flourish uh, and, and escape the immunity we have from natural infection and also from uh, vaccine-induced immunity. And that uh, I think as we increase our vaccination coverage, we're likely to see a reduction in deaths, which I think is a relief for many. And that um, you know, different sectors will be responding differently, and we're starting to see some sectors introducing vaccination mandates. But regardless of vaccination coverage rates, we will still need to continue with some of the public health and social measures that we've implemented in this country since uh, March uh, last year. But you know, COVID is not just about lives and saving lives. It's also a true dichotomy between the balance between saving lives and livelihoods. And uh, just to quote from this uh, Lancet COVID-19 Commission report released on uh, at the 75th the UN General Assembly, um, this quote I think captures it. The economic effects of this pandemic are unprecedented. 90% of countries are in recession in 2020 possibly exceeding the economic downturn during the Great Depression in the 1930s. 
COVID-19 saw and witnessed the first recession in Africa in 25 years and growth um, that was uh, our economies that were already in negative growth trends went worsened to about 5.1% in 2020. And I don't have the figures yet for 2021. So let's get a little bit about this COVID-19, even though our focus seems to be totally on it. It's also in the continent and in South Africa um, in, in uh, unfolding in the context of other health challenges. For example, we uh, are home to one in five uh, HIV infections that occur globally. We have a parallel TB epidemic. We have huge maternal mortality uh, rates um, that uh, disparities in, in maternal mortality rates, infant mortality rates, all linked to access to sexual reproductive health services. The epidemic and the pandemic of COVID-19 has unmasked a parallel non-communicable disease um, epidemic that we're facing. And there are a whole lot of challenges when we're dealing with all of these other health issues of injury and violence is access to health services when our focus and uh, prioritization of services is on saving lives from people with severe COVID illness. Now, when we think about the 3.3 billion uh, people in the global workforce at risk, majority of those are marginalized and deprived. Uh, many of them come from the in in informal economy that lacks social protections. These intersect with issues of race, gender, displacement, and the inequalities that underpin those who have or, and those who don't within our countries and between our countries. These individuals are also the ones that are likely to have least amount of access to safety issues. These have implications because of the daily uh, wage earning um, category. If they don't work, there's no income, there's no food. If there's restricted earnings, there's less food, less nutritious food. And if they do have food, there are few choices. Um, things like cash transfers, child allowances, food parcels, recovery and protection programs tend to be restricted to big business and don't, um, don't cover informal economies, etc. But uh, I also wanted to underscore the fragility of our food systems all the way from the sort of production through to harvesting, through processing, transport and retail. And not to forget that this is also occurring within big challenges that we have in terms of climate change and environmental degradation. So moving on to some of the good, and here I'll focus on examples, mainly from South Africa, where we've seen um, a very strong and proactive approach. And some of us may be old enough to remember some of the challenges we faced in responding to HIV AIDS in South Africa. In the case of COVID-19, we've had strong leadership right from the outset. The declaration of a national state of disaster on the 15th of March 2020. And if we contrast that to, to the UK, Neil Ferguson said that the number of coronavirus deaths in the UK would have been halved if lockdown had been introduced one week earlier. And I think the point here that I want to make is the speed with which the virus goes, that one week makes the difference between 50% of people being saved or not. And I think that that speed is something we have to constantly bear in mind, speed in terms of the transmission of the virus, but also speed in terms of knowledge generation, speed in terms of responses, et cetera. But I think one of the other things that we can uh, really celebrate is the good open communication. And I can tell you there are many countries that envy us in terms of us having our regular family meetings, the regular briefings by the Minister of Health, the information that's available from our advisories, etc. And I think that um, this increased access to real-time COVID-19 data worldwide is one manifestation of, of a world of open science and one aspect of open science. And I think it's gonna be very hard for us to go back 
And in fact, it provides us with opportunities to strengthen our open science efforts because we've seen paywalls restrict who can have access to publications and not and what publications or not, who can afford what and not. Now we've seen rapid publications and, um, and particularly in the preprint front, we've seen also rapid retractions. So I don't want to be too um, sort of to sound too idealistic in terms of all of this um, rapid access to information. But I think the rapid access for information for me, one of the really, really positive things is how the public has um, imbibed ah, the military ah. line. And that, um, you know, as an epidemiologist, I remember people ask, what is epidemiology? And trying to explain the science and also has social justice components to it. Whereas these days, you know, I'm discussing r noughts and uh, CFRs and all kinds of uh, other basic epidemiological concepts and, and other things, even as uh, other aspects and facets have started to emerge. The level of detailed public knowledge that's out there is quite impressive. And I think it's that kind of open science communication and working with the public in terms of imbibing and appreciating the value of science for advancing humanity is a very positive step. The scientific outputs, I'm not going to go through each one, but the innovations have been just absolutely breathtaking. If somebody asked me in March 2020, and somebody did, will we have a vaccine in the next two to three years? And my response was absolutely not. And I was really, you know, pleased to be proven wrong um, eight months later, where we have six efficacious vaccines. Not only do we have vaccines, but we're seeing vaccination. And I think in South Africa, despite some of our fits and starts in getting going, we impressively have just vaccinated over 10 million people and have also expanded the age very rapidly in terms of now making vaccine access to everybody over 18 years of age. That's particularly important for tertiary institutions where this is the majority of the population uh, that's, that's at our tertiary institutions. And I think with vaccinations, what we're seeing impressive data, for example, from the UK, if you look at the second wave, the figure in red, you see all the deaths that occurred as the numbers of infections increased. In gray, what you see during the third wave with high vaccination coverage rates, how you haven't stopped the number of infections in the face of the Delta variant, but death rates have come down substantially. What we're also seeing is the impact, for example, in Israel, where you look at households and households that have been individuals exposed to vaccinated versus um, those households where people have been not vaccinated, is you see almost an 80% reduction in um, infection in those where vaccination rates are high. Similarly, there's community level evidence um, in terms of the vaccine protection of unvaccinated uh, individuals. And for each 20% increase in vaccination, we see test positivity rates reducing by 50% in the unvaccinated people. So vaccines are important um, for individual level protections, but also for population level protections. Now moving on to the bad. And I think that while we've seen the best of humanity, we've also seen the worst of humanity in the form of corruption that uh, we've seen quite extensively in South Africa. We're already grappling with almost a decade of corruption. And as that's being right-sized, we've seen really deplorable stuff happening in the face of corruption and exploitation of funds that um, directed for COVID-19 and being misused. And I thought I'd also share this data from the UK where a fifth of UK COVID-19 contracts raise red flags for possible corruption. That doesn't make corruption any better, but saying it's not restricted to us, it's something that we have to work even harder 
to root out. And then the human rights violations where soldiers were deployed uh, during hard lockdowns and, uh, and, and the case and, and the, the several lives being lost uh, in that process, highlighting important training that needs to be done when soldiers are deployed um, into society. Now, moving on to some of the bad, as I said, we have parallel pandemics and epidemics of TB, uh, Ebola, HIV, et cetera. And, and HIV is the most recent of our pandemics. And we, as a global community, have made huge strides in terms of transforming AIDS from an inevitably fatal condition to one that's chronic and manageable through access to testing and uh, initiating those um, who are infected on antiretroviral treatment. We have many, many challenges in terms of preventing HIV infection. But some of the successes that we have, because like um, vaccination and the protection, if people who are living with HIV are initiated on treatment and virally suppressed, then the transmission rates of HIV are substantially reduced. And what we've seen during lockdowns from these studies is substantial reduction in HIV viral load testing as some of the platforms uh, were deployed and um, uh, used for COVID-19 testing. Uh, but also what we've seen is the, uh, because of innovations like multi-month dispensing, et cetera, little impact on uh, viral suppression, but uh, huge declines in testing and in treatment initiation. But also within this, there were people who had, were scared during these early stages of the epidemic of going to health facilities to access other services they need. And we know that from antenatal care, contraception, and, and anything you can think of, there was this general perception in the community that uh, if you can go to uh, our health facilities, you're gonna get COVID. And so there was some of that fear also impacting access to services. But I think, as I said, there's um, switching to some of the vaccine related issues. Uh, we can see again some of that hope and excitement that we had in November 2020 started to diminish uh, very rapidly. And uh, again, you see um, Africa in the spotlight in terms of the uh, very limited access to vaccine doses. And while in South Africa, we've now been able to secure enough doses for the population, there have been um, a lot of uh, politicking uh, and, um, and other things, uh, including market forces that have impacted who gets vaccines and who doesn't. And we've seen how uh, well-developed um, and well-resourced countries um, have been hoarding uh, vaccines. We've seen those countries that were able to develop vaccines, were able to vaccinate the population sooner, if not develop it, that they could do bulk production. Some of them were able to get access to advanced market commitments. Some were able to secure um, vaccines through vaccine diplomacy. And I give examples of those countries that were able to do that and some through bilateral purchasing agreements. And COVAX that was established as a way to bring equity in terms of vaccine, vaccine access actually got the lowest um, end of the stick there. And, uh, and even as we are struggling and scrambling to deliver first doses of vaccines, particularly in low middle income countries, we now see a lot of this promotion of booster vaccines. And when you look and see who's promoting these booster vaccines, it's those same companies that have reaped billions from COVID-19 vaccine markets now trying to make even more money, even though the evidence for booster promotion is uh, abs absent. And I think we need to heed the call of the WHO's uh, Director General uh, to, um, to in, ensure that we at least get first doses to everyone and know that no one is safe until everyone is safe. Another bad part of our response has been the growth in uh, conspiracy um, theories, miracle cures, and anti-vax misinformation. And I think there are all kinds of theories out there. And I think when people are uncertain and there's this um, inundation of information, 
really challenging to tease out what's true, what's not true. And every time we have a surge, we have some miracle cures, some of them being promoted by clinicians themselves. And in the first wave, we had hydroxychloroquine. In the second wave, we had ivermectin. And even though um, the, a master student from uh, UK University has shown that the data from Egypt was actually fraudulent and falsified, we still have clinicians who fight very hard every day to make sure people have access to ivermectin. As part of the anti-vaxxer campaign, we also see leading scientists and other social uh, influences uh, leading that. And so there are many challenges there to fight um, and ensure we get truth and we enable people to ascertain that. And I know other speakers on this panel will be addressing the issue of gender inequities. But for those who know me, I can't do a talk without touching on this. And while we have Sustainable Development Goal 5 in HIV, we fail to address the gender inequality issues. In uh, COVID, we've seen that coming again. In fact, a regression of many gains that have been made. And even though women are at the front line uh, in terms of healthcare, in terms of manufacturing and retail, they still have the short end of the stick and bear the brunt once again. And you'll be hearing more about it. But I also wanted to flag the shadow pandemic of violence against women and girls and share this data from UN Women that show a 243 million women and a million women and girls aged 15 to 49 have been subjected to sexual and or physical violence perpetrated by an intimate partner in the previous 12 months. So that just give you some indication of the other challenges that continue to grow and have been exacerbated in the presence of COVID-19. Uh, finally, just to look at the way forward, and I think just to start with this key lesson that we learned in HIV around our mutual interdependence and how through global solidarity, we are able to ensure access to life-saving antiretroviral treatment uh, across the globe and uh, substantially reduce mortality rates from um, AIDS-related um, comorbidities. Likewise, in COVID-19, there are many opportunities for us. The COVID-19, for example, pandemic has provided a new lens for the nexus between science, politics, and society. And um, as we pursue the path of the sustainable development goals, and notably the acceleration uh, to reach the 2030 targets, we once again reminded how we can do that through our mutual interdependence. We are feeling some of the impacts, but there's still impacts to emerge in terms of COVID-19. We don't have a handle on long COVID. The orphans, as uh, young parents increasingly lose their lives to COVID, the stress, uh, the post-traumatic stress disorders, but also mental health issues, dealing with misinformation, with food security, and the list goes on and on. Tertiary institutions, in my opinion, are microcosm of society, and also importantly, a home to a demographic dividend for Sub-Saharan Africa, namely youth. And how we realize um, the vision of uh, uh, Madiba in terms of knowledge as the great equalizer, I think will become defining moments for our tertiary institutions. I think we've seen in COVID-19 that we can wallow, we can hide, we can cocoon, or we can be architects of our own destiny. And there are many examples that I can quote, but I just want to um, share with you a few. And for example, in the face of in incredible uncertainty, Dr. Mazda from University of Stellenbosch um, diligently every morning synthesizing data as it became available and sending that out through WhatsApp was a lifeline to many people trying to figure out what to do every day. I think the way some scientists and laboratories pivoted using the HIV PCR platforms and diagnostics, but importantly how our molecular surveillance enabled us 
to strengthen our local evidence-based approaches by identifying the beta variant way before it was described and helping us understand the new surge of infections and also simultaneously enabling us to evaluate the vaccines that were being purchased and their efficacy in the face of emerging variants. And this continues to be important um, uh, shining lights uh, that we see in terms of how science and locally generated science is enhancing our local response, but also informing global responses. We have to lead by example. And I think an important first step for faculty is taking stock and students as we implement recovery strategies, what has worked, what has not. Um, we've all been grappling with the fourth industrial revolution. I think COVID-19 just fast tracked us on that. And to try and understand this human machine interface, what are the implications for how and what we do as individuals in our teams, in our departments, faculty and institutions, who got left behind and why. We've learned the importance of lifelong learning, problem solving, the new skill sets that are needed for resilience. And we've also witnessed the impact of basic education disruptions and, um, the, what, and know what those implications are going to be for future cohorts of students coming to tertiary institutions. And if tertiary institutions don't take the lead to find novel and innovative approaches to uh, recover this time loss, then um, we, we're on a very different and negative trajectory. We have had seen unprecedented, and I, my spelling error there, speed for SARS-CoV-2 knowledge generation. This has set a new bar for addressing our other challenges that we carry forward. It also highlights the type of collaborations we need, the multidisciplinary approaches, and as I mentioned earlier on com communication, this interface with public and politicians uh, is not something we can go back on, but we can build on from. But ultimately what we're dealing with are complex challenges with no quick fixes, no silver bullets, and also there's no room for complacency. Vaccination is a first step towards normality and recovery and rebuilding. It's a new opportunity for us to build back stronger and better and really translate this wonderful phrase we have of Ubuntu that uh, about being together, sharing together, and we are because of others. And these bonds of reciprocity um, in the context of vaccination can be translated to no one is safe unless we're all safe. And how do we build that and continue that ethos and, um, and, 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 and standards as we move forward? And I want to close with this quote from Pope Francis, that this is a moment to dream big, to rethink our priorities, what we value, what we want, what we seek and to commit to act in our daily life on what we have dreamed of. I thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. This was um, fantastic um, um, and very much appreciated. I can see some people have posted questions in the chat. I'm going to pick um, the first two. Um, can I read it out to you and you will reply? Um, the one question is, how do you advise, how do we tackle the vaccine hesitancy in our academic sector? A serious concern is that students are not willing, willing to vaccinate. So how do we balance the right to refuse a vaccination and the public health imperatives? So there is a tension there if you can speak to that. If you can unmute as well. Okay, thanks. Um, so that's a really important question. And I think there are two levels, um, or at least two groups of individuals who are not being vaccinated. And the one group is those who are hesitant, and there are some good reasons for that. And then there's another group who will not be vaccinated, and there's a whole set of reasons for that. So I want to separate the hesitancy from the anti-vaxxers. And the hesitant, um, I think that's where those who've been vaccinated have a very important role to play. And I think some of the hesitancy is about the speed with which the vaccines have been developed, worry about safety, worry about um, all kinds of potential side effects. And I think as the numbers of individuals globally 
who've been vaccinated increases and as people share their experiences, then I think as Malcolm Gladwell described in his book called Tipping Point, you have, uh, it, when you introduce anything new, you have instant and early adopters, and then it becomes normative. And then you always have a small proportion that are what he describes as laggards. And I think um, as academic institutions, uh, we are important role models. And if we can't get it right in terms of uh, ensuring uh, people who want to be vaccinated get vaccinated and understand the importance of vaccination, then I think um, that's a huge failure. And I'm not one to give in uh, just like that. So I'm not saying it's easy and I think we're gonna try. And I think the more we try collectively, um, and the more evidence we generate around the safety and the benefits, not only at an individual level, but at a population level of increasing vaccination coverage. And I, I'm very proud that as South Africans, we have been able to secure sufficient vaccine. Not, not always proud on how we manage to secure those vaccines, but we have it. And it's not a luxury we can afford to miss uh, not getting vaccinated, thanks. Thank you. I'm picking from the questions and I'm hoping you can answer some of them in the chat later as you read through them, you could um, reply. But the one, one more I want to ask you before we move on is um, which measures and lessons have we learned now and can we implement now to prepare for the next, you know, God forbid we have a next, but of course one never knows, for the next future epidemic pandemic how do we prepare and what lessons have we learned specifically so thanks very much and if i had all afternoon i'll be going at it but um i think the one issue is with increasing urbanization and uh, the sort of um the way we are seeing the jump from animals to humans uh, as we uh, disrupt uh, the uh, natural habitats, et cetera, and interact and interface with animals more, we'll see many more uh, pandemics emerging. And I think just if we take the coronaviruses, we've seen first in the early 2000s, we had uh, the SARS-CoV-1. We've seen after that the MERS virus, which was restricted to the Middle East and um, areas and and uh, you know um, we've had yeah, before, yeah. we've seen Ebola etc. So we're going to see more pandemics um, as we live and move forward. And so part of preparedness, I think, uh, is for example our investments in the science investments in the SARS-CoV-1 and MERS enabled us to develop uh, to have a vaccine within eight months because the backbone and a lot of the heavy lifting for the vaccines that we have for SARS-CoV-2 we established way before so we have to think about this knowledge generation process as it's not something you initiate when you need it in fact it's anticipating and preparing. A key issue is strong health information systems with early warning signs. It's about building the resilience through strengthening our healthcare delivery systems. It's about ensuring that we have a more away public so that when interventions are put into place, what we call public and, and social measures for containment, there's a good understanding and co-ownership. And I think it's about building bridges um, across uh, those um, pol politics uh, and politicians and, and citizens so that what we have is trust and accountability. And when those are in place, we're able to respond much more rapidly and much more effectively. Thank you. Thank you, that was great. Um, Professor Abdul Karim, if we had, if we'd all be in the room, you'd hear a loud applause. And of course, that's always the thing with the online one has to sort of, um, you know, kind of emptiness and barrenness on the other side. And um, let me reassure you, exactly the hands are coming, I can see clapping, that's wonderful. Um, Prof, um, it was really very, very much appreciated. May I ask that you can read through the chat, see the questions, see if there are specific ones you could respond. Um, other than that, I want to thank you and I would like to move to our next speaker, um, Professor Linda Ronnie. And I think she is online with us. If Linda, you can put your camera on for us. 
Professor Ronnie is a professor of organization, behavior, and people management at UCT School of Management Studies. Professor Ronnie recently completed a term as Dean of the Faculty of Commerce at UCT. Linda, you also did a wonderful study, a national study on how um, COVID impacted um, the academic world and particularly um, women in the academic world. And we very, very much look forward to um, your presentation. Let me see that we can spotlight you so that you are on camera and no one else. Um, if we can take the spotlight off, um, there we are. Fantastic, Linda, we can see you. We cannot hear you just yet. Linda, we can't hear you just yet. Yeah. There we are, perfect. Hey. Fantastic. Okay, good, thanks. Thank you, Birgit, and hello, everyone. Uh, of course, this is no one's favorite way to um, present uh, data, but we'll do the best that we can. Um, okay, so I'm here on behalf of the COVID-19 Academic Research Study, um, a group uh, of researchers from Stellenbosch, uh, UCT, and UWC, uh, some of whom are amongst us, so can also answer your questions when you ask them later. Okay, so a little background uh, to the study. We examined uh, the impact, obviously, of, uh, of lockdown, especially the enforced lockdown, on uh, women academics through a large-scale survey uh, across South Africa's uh, public universities. Um, so the survey included a... Um, open-ended section that allowed for detailed, unlimited responses by the respondents. Uh, and that section of it uh, yielded a substantial volume of qualitative data. Uh, and I'll share some of those results uh, with you in a moment. Um, the survey was completed uh, during the March to August period last year. And we received uh, just over 2,000 full responses. So some of the key findings for us include uh, the shifting concept of home, uh, child care and academic work, academic guilt, self-esteem and self-worth, and well-being. So I'm just going to share little snippets of this, even though these five key findings are in fact five papers. So the shifting concept of home is really quite an interesting notion because it uh, showed us that our usual concept uh, of home as a place of refuge, uh, a place where we could be safe, shifted to more of an unsettled uh, environment where uh, one of congestion, of competition, of constraint, uh, certainly in terms of uh, women's academic work. And it, and it shifted also to a space that, that was claimed, conceded, and in a process of constant negotiation, really, between women academics and people who lived in the same space. So partners, children, other occupants. And ultimately, um, it showed uh, a space or a place that was deeply unequal uh, for women uh, with potentially dire consequences for their academic careers. So in each of the findings, I'm just going to show you little snippets uh, of some of the data. And these are some of the extracts from uh, our sample. Uh, going to the office helped me put barriers between work and private life. Now these barriers are gone. Uh, it brought tension in the household and in time led to a deterioration of my relationship with my husband soon to be ex-husband. And finally, I've been a bit sad actually to see how quickly my family 
casually renders me a servant when I'm constantly around and not able to avail myself of the professional workspaces. So if one thinks about home, then there was a blurring of space, of lines, uh, and uh, a potential kind of clash uh, in what um, one would typically see as a place where you go home and relax. So we are also quite conscious that the meaning of home can't be explained outside of the gender inequalities that divide the allocation and understanding of work between women and their partners. Once in the home, uh, most women academics have to contend with these inequalities in expectations and obligations in ways that they might not have otherwise in a professional setting. The second key finding was around childcare and academic work. And I would imagine any parent sitting here would say, well, of course. Um, so this is just a quick um, visual of uh, the share of women who found academic work extremely difficult by ages of work, uh, ages of children in the home. And you can see that um, uh, there were also women uh, who uh, had no children who found it uh, quite difficult to be uh, to carry on with, with their academic work. But without a doubt, uh, the group that found academic work most difficult uh, was uh, women academic parents who had children who were under uh, six years old. More generally, of course, women were caught up in the demands of competing roles, teacher, nurturer, comforter, uh, and then academic in terms uh, of research and writing uh, as well. So um, one can imagine and, and uh, something that we found as well was that uh, research really took a back seat uh, in terms of academic work. Our third uh, theme really was around academic guilt. And here um, we defined academic guilt as a negative emotion that results from a perceived failure to meet an academic obligation. Um, as noted, academic women made difficult choices uh, among competing demands and uh, sometimes work was chosen over attending to children uh, and teaching often displaced research. So some of the forms of guilt that we found were coping guilt, work-life balance guilt, productivity guilt, uh, and relational guilt. As uh, some of our participants told us, at the moment, two courses are waiting for me. And I don't know if I have the mental strength to even start again. I feel defeated and yet I feel guilty about it, like I should be able to cope. While another said, I'm also feeling very guilty that my own research has suffered because online teaching is intensive. It takes time in designing meaningful interaction and providing it on a variety of platforms so that students could access it, depending on what they had available. So in terms of guilt, guilt was common, it was constant, and it was consequential for academic women. We also found that academic guilt isn't resolvable between the two primary tensions of academic work and family care. There's little evidence uh, for example, of compensatory measures that resolve work-family conflict under lockdown conditions. If anything, attempts to make up for time lost on either work or family simply increased feelings of guilt. Our fourth finding was around self-esteem and self-worth. 
we found negative emotional experiences related to self-worth, social comparisons and fear of judgment and peer pressure. You are to extract from our data. Every course has had to be radically redeveloped and I'm done. And I constantly grapple with technology fails. This has diminished and undermined my sense of who I am as an academic professor and the quality of knowledge I'm able to convey to students. I now appear foolish and incompetent and nothing seems to work effectively. Another said, one of the biggest issues with lockdown has been my need to keep everything going and not to show that I'm struggling to juggle everything. I know, come time for promotion, none of the men and also none of the women without young children or older children that require special attention are going to give me an inch of slack. It will be, well, you know, such and such did it. Why are you not able to? So participants in our study doubted their competence and efficacy during the lockdown. Perceived failure to prove their competence impacted on their sense of worth and their sense of identity as academics. Feelings of self-blame and low self-esteem were felt regardless of the levels of productive work, in part because of the relentless pressure of some managers disregard both the circumstances and the actual value of women's academic labor. Our final finding was around well-being. And yeah, many women in the academy expressed a sense of frustration, of weariness, of being overwhelmed, which we referred to as emotional taxation from three key sources really, the home life, the social milieu, so the context, friends, family, et cetera, and the work environment. And I want to share this uh, quote, which I think encapsulates most of the feelings uh, that uh, our sample expressed to us. You have to be the emotional rock for everyone and meet the demands of work. And in the end, your tank is running on empty but you must smile. You cannot debrief yourself from work on your way home so that you can nurture your family. Work and home life are blended and neither is getting the attention it needs. Your family asks you why you are grumpy all the time because the new normal is not normal at all. The uncertainty is psychologically taxing and this affects home life and work life. So these were essentially, and in a nutshell, five of the key themes that we found in our work. And uh, while that may be um, sobering, I, I think there are some uh, good aspects to our study. So I think the good news is that uh, things that we've known all along are confirmed in the data our, because our findings surfaced critical issues. Some of them, uh, gender inequality in academia, uh, the gendered nature of work, uh, institutional practices that entrench the patriarchal nature of our society, the burden of parenthood, and care that falls to women and not only and when i speak about care uh, let me also extend that to the care for others uh, the care for uh, uh, dependents which may be parents etc uh, we also looked at the importance or found the importance of support structures and then finally the we see that there is limited conception uh, within, um, within uh, the academic context of what digital engagement actually is and what the implications are for academics for performance. 
So let's think a little about addressing the challenges that uh, the data is highlighted. Um, we think there should be a uh, change, changes in institutional policies uh, to take account of, make provision for, and I would say as well acknowledge the emotional health needs of academics, including through the provision of counseling resources. Then uh, changes need to take place as well at the institutional planning level, and in particular, uh, in what constitutes performance management uh, during this time, because some effort must be made to moderate those so that the pressure to perform and be what is considered a real academic takes account of the realities of women's work under lockdown conditions. Recognition in the, in, and, and uh, appropriate priority should be given to how work and family evolve through the academic career uh, life cycle, really. The university, any university, has a responsibility to look at, to evaluate, and to delegitimize the organizational processes uh, that produce gendered inequalities. And then finally, uh, we need to be thinking about what digital engagement is and what it can provide and what effort it takes to produce engagement with our students via digital platforms and find lasting and additional ways uh, to support our student body. I'll stop there. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you, Linda. This is um, very, very interesting and very, very moving. I'm seeing a number of, um, let me see all the speaker views and we can change that. I'm seeing a number of comments are coming through to me directly saying this is really touching a nerve. This is touching a raw nerve. Um, people saying they're, they're close to tears. I think it's about being recognized that you are articulating what people are feeling, feeling in sort of silence and in shame and in quietness at home, but you are putting it out there. So I think this is an extraordinary um, research and um, thank you very, very much. There's a question I want to pick up, um, but before I do, a quick question on your publication. I know it's published in part or in full. Will you be able to share a um, DOI in the chat? Um, yes. Okay. Um, yes, before we get to the end of this, I'll, I'll, I'll try and do that. Indeed. Thank you. And just a reminder for everyone, it is in the uh, YouTube um, channel if you, day after tomorrow, um, if you want to review it again. Just a quick question, Linda. The question was in terms of childcare and academic work and the spread across the academic hierarchy. Did you find anything um, uneven? in terms of the difference between those who are lecturer level and associate or senior professor level, women? Did you, did you see any um, spread there? Okay, so one of the, now we can, now, now that we have the data, we can see the things we should have done and the questions we should have asked. So in order to uh, be as kind of uh, confidential as possible, we only asked, um, our sample, how many years they've been in academia for, um, and uh, what the kind of range of ages were if they had children. So that was that was a bit, it's a bit tricky to answer that question, um, uh, Birgit and whoever uh, has asked that. Um, um, I think uh, the certainly if I recall over the papers, um, there were there were people with with younger children, certainly, and who tended then to be younger uh, academics uh, or new newer academics or be in the system for uh, less than ten years. Uh, they really felt the brunt um, of the lockdown. Um, and I mean, any, as I say, anyone who's sitting here, who's been with, uh, who's uh, 
either sort of been a uh, and having those experiences uh, during this pandemic or like me not having small children but being responsible uh, for academics uh, who had these challenges uh, and having staff uh, tell me stories of how they recorded videos while sitting in their car, uh, how they did these things at two o'clock in the morning. Mm. Um, one must really take one's hat off to, to women academics everywhere, I think. And uh, for those of you who are here and who uh, contributed to, to, our, um, to our survey, thank you so much for sharing it. I, I think we, all of us um, who've been part of looking at this data can say how moved we were um, by your stories. And um, may I say as well that um, all of us, any of us, but let me speak on my own behalf, um, very willing to come out to your institutions to share uh, this, uh, this data with you uh, and to share it in a little more detail if you so want. Um, can I also Berger, have a shout out to the to the person who managed to find humor and everything. And after um, telling us quite a bit in the open question, then ended it with um, and good luck to anyone who is uh, who is going to have to code this data. So thank you, especially to you. That's great. And I've got one more question, um, which is um um sorry first i want to just echo and make sure everybody's heard that you've offered to speak to institutions be that institutional forum be that at senate um some senate sort of permit quick presentations so people please do call on professor ronnie for that presentation it's important it's important particularly because certain things certain hardwired policies and practices need to change need to adjust and that's our next question the question here is that um what is being done um, in terms of institutional processes? Um, some processes remain um, cemented into the system, be the promotion policies or uh, you know whatever, or HR policies or leave policies or who's emailing whom at what time of night. Is there anything that you know of is being done to substantively shift some of these old practices and cemented off policies that you are aware of? Yeah, certainly I'd say within my own institution, uh, there's a very vigorous debate. Um, uh, the, um, the academics union in particular are, are, are taking this on. Um, and, and I think it's a crucial debate we need to have because lots of the issues that we're speaking about now are merely things that have been highlighted through the pandemic. It's not as if they didn't exist before. That's, that, I think, is a real myth that we must, uh, that we must deal with head on. Um, and so it's, it's time to shift in the academy. It truly is. Thank you very much. And I see that um, Cyril Walters is also with us answering questions. So thank you very much. Cyril, of course, was part of the study and um, is publishing with you um, on this um, paper. Um, Professor Ronnie, thank you so much for this presentation. It touched us all deeply. I know those who are affected and those who perhaps are just allies of those who are affected or those who kind of can see what is going on. And I want to ask people to really pick up on your um, offer to present to the institutions. Um, please, Linda, if I can ask you to go back into the chat, see if there's oh, well. anyone that you want to respond to specifically, I'd really appreciate it. From all of us, thank you very, very much. I want to move on to our next speaker and um, we um, have Professor Tiboho Moja. And I wonder if you can, Tiboho, put on your camera. Thank you. That's lovely. Tiboho Moja is a professor, clinical professor of higher education at NYU, New York University, um, at the Steinhardt School of Education. She is a lifelong achievement award recipient from the NRF and the editor in chief of the Journal of Student Affairs in Africa. Tiboho, it's an absolute joy having you here, and we look forward to hearing you speak about um, the good, the bad, and the genius coming out of um, perhaps Africa specifically. Thank you. Thank you, Birgit. Um, I'll share my screen just now. So let's start with that.
We got it? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. That's great. Okay. So you, you're welcome to put it onto presentation mode. But yes. uh, some of us don't prefer it that way. You, you I'm getting to that just now. Mm -hmm. Okay, there we go. So thank you very, very much. And um, I'm really honored to be part of this HUM webinar today. And uh, listening to the other colleagues speak, learned a lot from that. And I think they provided a nice surgery to some of the things that I'll be touching on or so. As we know, change is very hard to predict. It is hard to predict. And I'm one of those people or the activist in me that always liked the concept of disruption. And when real disruption hit us, I didn't like it, but I tried looking for the positive out of it or so. I work in the area of higher education and studying higher education systems or so. And uh, one of the things we always talk about is how the university in the same way as the church has really survived through ages. It has survived, it's still recognizable. It's very hard to change or so. And I remember in some of my early days when we were looking at transformation of universities or so, we were always talking about or reading about how it is easier to move a graveyard than to change a university. And uh, I would like to argue that we are at that point now where universities cannot afford not to change. Listening to what Professor Roni has just presented that's just one example of what we need to be looking into and looking at changes that are needed. Change, of course, can be defined in many, many ways. There have been adaptations made along the way, and uh, some of them have happened because of incidents like wars or when there's been a political turmoil or when there are strikes either by students or students or so. But this is a different kind of adaptation that we need to make, knowing what we know now that we didn't know before. I remember at the turn of the century, I don't know how many of you still remember the Y2K uh, bug or the Millennium bug, what was referred to the Millennium bug. We in the higher education sector were really excited to see the kinds of changes that were going to come out of that. And uh, one of my favorite sort of, um, sort of uh, knowledge gurus, Peter Drucker, talked about um, uh, or pred predicted the changes that were going to happen and saying that are going to happen because of uh, ICT. ICT is here, it's going to change the way we operate in the universities. It's going to change the universities to look different from what they are. And um, that didn't happen. We waited, we waited two decades and the pandemic hit and the disruptions that came because of the pandemic have been the main factor in the changes that we have seen in the universities. They were not brought about by ICT, but we were very lucky and glad to have ICT as an asset to help us with those changes or so. We saw all over, the, all over the world, university buildings that stood empty, but the normal activities were carrying on behind the scenes, teaching, research, some public service, and major, major student support. I put student support as major because for those activities to continue to happen, they wouldn't happen without uh, the students being there and the students being held to participate and continue to bring some kind of normality into the system per se. We saw a major reimagination for survival, complete reimagination of what we're doing all services within the universities were reimagined. 
we saw senior leadership and student affairs services being at the forefront of the innovations. They were working in ways that they have never worked before. They became the essential workers of higher education. We don't recognize them as that. They need to be recognized for that. And that's another change that we need to put on the agenda that we do have essential workers within the institutions. They have supported students behind the scenes. Most of the time, the work tends to be invisible in some ways. There was a need for remote student support in ways that we didn't anticipate in order to continue to enhance students' learning and development, continue to build communities and advance the social justice agenda. You can imagine students who were dealing with um, uh, the whole transition effect of coming into the university. Coming to university takes a lot to transition into, coming from high schools and all. And somebody had to help those students remotely to help them transition into that. Just transitioning again out of uh, the physical space back to home or other safe places to continue studying. There was that strong need for support or so. Support went beyond just enhancing teaching and learning in ways that we're used to, but even in support in providing basic needs in some instances, food security was a major issue. Accommodation for some students, it was travel, international students in particular that had to travel or so. There were lots of changes that were happening and everybody had to act at the spare of the moment or so. We saw uh, the need to pay greater attention for students living and learning, uh, for students living and learning with disabilities in particular or so as well under those circumstances. So a lot of the bad has been said, a lot of uh, the good that has come out of uh, the pandemic has been said, but I also say that there is the good out of a bad situation, what the title of this webinar has referred to as the indeed, a, a ingenious or so. I just read a manuscript uh, recently written by one of the colleagues who was working on higher education policy in Afghanistan. And the title of the manuscript is that a rose rises from the rubble. And I was curious as to how he came about with that title. And he said one day when he was walking around all discouraged about what he was seeing in the country and all that, he saw a rose that had grown in the middle of a rubble and that gave him hope that there's something good that can come out of a bad situation if we look closer and work with it. So with that, I want to move to some of uh, the research that came out of the pandemic. And thanks to Professor Rani on uh, sharing some of the research that they did during that period. Thanks for the data that was produced that uh, Professor Abdul also shared with us also. And uh, for some of us working in another area, and in this case, putting my head now as the Editor-in-Chief for the Journal of Student Affairs in Africa, want to also look at what we did and what came out of that. So we had, we made a call for papers, trying to understand issues that, are, that were being addressed in the institutions in the field from African scholars perspective. We very quickly moved onto putting a call together. We didn't know what to expect, where people were operating from, who's going to respond, when are they going to respond or so. But we said, maybe it's time to really, really take a chance and really look at that. So to our surprise, we are inundated, 110 submissions within a short period of time. 
the spread of the submissions, there were 18 African countries that were represented and some counted twice because they were also co-authoring with uh, the proposals that were submitted to us. Then in addition to that, though the call was for Africa, we saw submissions that came from five other countries. I mean, from the US to other countries outside uh, the continent or so that were interested in sharing the experiences, particularly in relation to student affairs services that were being provided. So the topics were very broad and uh, they were uh, presenting work that they had already embarked on or were about to embark on. So we had uh, some work that was already advanced and some that was just starting at that point in time. So with that, for me, it is hard to sort of like cover everything that uh, came out of that, but I decided that with the volume that we produced, which was our special issue of the General for Student Affairs in Africa, volume nine, number one, that came out, that um, I will focus on some of uh, the areas that um, I want to highlight. And I've chosen three areas. I've put the, the link to the journal, is an online journal, is available free of charge. It's peer reviewed. You can get access to it through that link. And um, I'm sure Bill Gates, you can post the link onto the chat as well. So three areas that I chose was uh, disability, what happened with uh, students living with disabilities, looking at the creativity that came in working with student leaders, and also looking at some of the theoretical work that came out of that a framework that can help us think about how we do our work in the field of student affairs services or so. And I recognize that with this, I won't do justice to all the work that was done, but I'm just giving you the hors d'oeuvres, the taste into some of the work that came in there and that uh, you can go look at uh, the specific papers through the journal or so. The one that um, I've highlighted there, I've said it, uh, disability came through in, uh, was sort of a disguised blessing in some ways because of the positive things that came out of that. Disability worldwide was highlighted as uh, one area that we needed to pay extra attention to as to how those students were going to continue to learn, how those students were going to continue to be supported for success or so. So the one study that I'm highlighting here used the capabilities approach concept of conversion factors, which reveals that circumstances can either enable or constrain learning, the learning of students or so. And we know that that capabilities approach comes out of the work that was done in the 1980s by Amata Sen, famous Amata Sen, which tends to push us to focus on the capabilities of persons to achieve. So with this study, they used that capabilities approach to focus on the students living with disabilities capability to achieve or so. They did a survey, they sent a survey out and um, they learned from uh, the study that they conducted. The positive thing that came out of that was that uh, students mentioned that they learned better in online and remote learning despite some of the challenges they had to face. And we should keep in mind that these students were facing challenges that all other students were facing that I'll uh, mention later on, as well as challenges that they had to face because of the different types of disabilities or so. The positive thing is that uh, some students already had the equipment that they needed they had already gotten the computers and the learning tools that they needed, 
that they were using in the classroom. So for them, it wasn't a matter of starting running around to try and get um, those, uh, the, those tools that they needed. The students already had uh, disability accommodations that were already part of their learning. They could take more time in submitting the assignments or so, so they were already in a better position to pursue the studies. And an interesting outcome, I mean, these are from codes that students had that I'm not sharing the codes with you, but students mentioning things like they had less anxiety of studying at home than being in a crowded classroom. So on a day-to-day -day basis, seeing the students in our classrooms, we do not realize the anxieties that they have. They might not express them, they might not share them, they might not utter them, but through the studies, we've got to learn more to understand the students more that they actually have anxiety being in a crowded classroom. And uh, they talked about appreciating access to recorded lessons so that they could study at a different pace. And uh, they really liked what some of the professors did or some of the institutions did, moving more to the mode of assignments versus using examinations, which also bring in another level of anxiety or so. So what came out of this study, one major recommendation that was made was for us to consider using the universal design of learning to cater for all kinds of diversity. We know that with the universal design of learning, we have flexibility in how we design our learning so that we can accommodate uh, different students. And once more, there's the URL for this particular article. The second one that I want to sort of highlight is the one that talked about uh, online training for student leadership, reimagination and reorientation of orientating student leaders also. So the uh, professionals involved in this recognize the fact that uh, having to do online training or orientation for the student leaders, they have to recognize the fact that uh, they're losing the social constructivist design element in the development process for the students or so. And they had to think about other ways of reconstructing that for remote learning while using the online uh, and learning theories and using the guiding principles for that. This was an impressive article too, that, or a study that they did, drawing from the theories that we have, a whole lot of theories, the ID framework on how to analyze, design, develop, implement, and evaluate the learning process or so. They drew from the affordance theory, Again, there's the UDL, the Universal Design for Learning came through with that. The multimedia principle that they should focus on using different uh, media and uh, also drawing from the community of inquiry theoretical framework. So this was done with great thought and a lot of planning into how to plan something that people might think it's very easy. We have been doing training of the student leaders and so on. So just take the material and put it online or so. That wasn't the case. They had to really put much more thought into that. So what came out of that was redesigning the program itself and reach the student practitioner's experiences as well as uh, everybody else's experience on that. So that's the second article I wanted to highlight. And the third one that I want to bring to your attention is a framework that was developed by a number of uh, scholars too that uh, did the work, did the research, drawing data from a broad range of uh, uh, participants or so, and developed a framework for how we can provide service to the students, taking into consideration students' context contextual environment. 
we know that uh, there were lots of challenges when it came to institutional resources and the external social context within which students were in. And uh, I think some of those were touched on, particularly by Professor Abdul, talking about the environment that students found themselves in. Also by the other colleague, Professor Roni, talking about um, the uh, women academics, the challenges that they faced working from home or so. You can think of the students as well, being in that environment and the double whammy being a woman and a student but also different students irrespective of that gender. We know that students are social beings. They want to be in a social environment and that they learn within positive contextual, contextualized ways or so. So what happened with COVID is that the context of learning changed drastically. We know that things really changed and uh, we, we found that students found themselves having to deal with the family context and dynamics that uh, being at universities, being in institutions, they sometimes manage to shield themselves from that or escape that, particularly if they're residential students or so. So that space was taken away. So keeping that in mind, the gender roles that they had to play in families that came through again with a study about uh, women academics during the pandemic, mothering, uh, being a wife, being a sister, being the girl in the family, so much expected of women within that context or so. They had to re renegotiate space. We know our social context, social infrastructure in South Africa. Some people live in one room homes being at university is an escape for that. Now having to be home in a lockdown and renegotiating that space to find the space to study or so. The family home external environment as well. The uh, electricity issues in South Africa, the blackouts, the safety that they had to deal with, transport issues, and many other factors that affected that need to be functional for success or so. So we know that uh, student affairs services plays a role in mediating some of these uh, uh, environmental factors or domains as referred to in the study. And this study in particular highlighted four of those domains. In my next slide, I want to show those so the first domain that they identified, so you can see the model there with student affairs services right in the middle, trying to work their way in um, really managing that and uh, looking at the four domains, one labeled there as a personal domain, which includes the personal matters to the student that characteristics, that drive, that motivation, that intellectual abilities and so on, that disabilities and so on is one domain in itself. Then there's a social cultural uh, domain, which has to do with the resources. And that's what we had a lot in the earlier presentations as well the debates, the anti-vax, the uh, hesitancy for vax, the gender roles that we touched on, the gender-based violence and other factors that uh, students had to deal with. Dealing with grief that was highlighted earlier, dealing with loss of income, having food insecurity and so on. That's another area. The third area, which is the academic one, has to do with the domain where you are looking at the teaching frameworks, what kind of teaching frameworks are being adapted for operating from home? What kind of losses are there in terms of uh, institutional culture that they're used to or the ways of living and learning that they're used to that they have to adapt? How can they continue to be involved as we know that student involvement is very important for success also. 
So we have that as another domain that um, SAS um, has to sort of navigate and work with. And the last one, which we touched a lot on, is also the public domain, the infrastructure issues, the safety, and so on. So this was an exciting study that really looked at all those and looking at how we can sort of think about our roles in relation to those domains and how we support student success from that. I want to move to um, the fact that uh, there were less, lots of lessons that were learned out of that, hoping that uh, you'll still go back and read the journal and read the articles, many others that I didn't even mention or so. But I tried also extracting some lessons in general that uh, I feel I could share with you that we learned as a, a higher education sort of um, constituency that uh, the great lessons that we learned, we know that um, in the past, crises have led to the development of new policies also and long-term solutions. There's a study that covered that. And at the same time, it was interesting hearing, uh, oh, reading some of the questions in the chat to Professor Roni about whether the new policies that have come out of this come out of the studies, come out of the experiences, come out of this. That in itself is a study that's out there. Let's see what policies came out, what changes came out that are not just short-term, but long-term solutions to some of the old problems that we have been dealing with that have been highlighted now. Some of these lessons are very obvious. The investment in digital infrastructure and internet connectivity, which is not just the responsibility of the institutions, but the country as a whole. What has the country learned and what are they going to be doing about uh, investment in digital infrastructure? To promote digital learning, to promote digital work, it's for all spheres of life and not just uh, uh, the education sphere. And this one, I like the investment in laptop, in laptops rather than desktops, since they are more flexible to use in office and at home. I'm starting to hear this one more and more. My institution in particular has adopted a policy that they're going to replace all desktops with laptops now. Of course, you have to have resources for that, or you can do it gradually whenever there's a need to buy a new desktop the days of the desktop are over, that people need to operate with desktops to have that flexibility or so. Some things have changed and uh, we need to keep up with that. Social justice issues, they were highlighted a lot under the pandemic and they are to remain on our agenda given the inequities we have in our societies and uh, there's need for specific policies that need to be put in place to address those. As I said, the pandemic didn't bring in or utter in new challenges only. They also highlighted the existing challenges that we had that we need to focus on. Mental health services that need to be boosted to serve the broader university community. We all have small mental health offices and services. My own university here in New York the time to appointment to be seen by a counselor is usually very, very long. And now with the pandemic, so many people needing that. Institutions need to take that seriously and focus on putting more investment into mental health services for us to continue to function well or so. We know that um, we learn data analytics, monitoring and evaluations have become key to finding solutions. And we have seen some of that data that was presented in the first uh, uh, presentation or so, how important it is to keep that data. And um, continuing on the lesson that um, there's need to save or put funds aside for emergency situations. We know that uh, in South Africa, there were lots of delays in financial aid disbursements and so on. And uh, institutions that had uh, 
funds set aside could at least use those while waiting. Hunger cannot wait, learning cannot wait while other students are continuing learning and we are waiting for your financial aid disbursement or so. And lastly, I want to say that uh, we learned that productivity is possible without the need for physical space on campus and a saving on infrastructure such as new buildings. And uh, we can use that to redirect money to invest in digital infrastructure or so. I don't know what is happening in South Africa, but with this last point in my own institution here now, a decision has been taken that all administrators only have to come in twice a week. They don't need to be on campus every day. And that is redefining space and how we use space and how we're going to move forward. Are we going to hold some of the infrastructure sort of plans that we had in place, realizing that uh, we, we can still have good productivity without being on campus or so. So lastly, I would say out of this, there have been lots of adaptations, innovations, lesson learned, and overall, it was a challenge, but positive things came out of this experience. And I thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you to Boho, Professor Moja. It was a pleasure hearing you um, foreground, particularly the, um, the unexpected and the ingenious. I almost heard you say the indigenous, and I would have liked that kind of overlap, the lovely parallel there. Um, we had some questions and comments. The one thing I would like you to perhaps to comment on, it was um, sent to me privately. How do you feel um, you foregrounded student affairs and that a lot is being done in sort of these invisible spaces to support students? Um, we recognize student affairs to do a lot of that work. How do you feel um, academics could be better supported in doing some of this invisible work? Supporting students, speaking to students, helping them one on one, being in consultation with them. Um, is there a comment you can make about that point? Yeah, thanks, uh, Birgit. I think for academics, a lot also came through. I didn't touch on that, I just focused on uh, um, student services or so. I think uh, there was a lot of uh, need for academic support for faculty, for teaching staff, for academics in general also, in how to use the technology effectively. What we did overnight was just take what we were doing in the classroom and had talking heads go onto Canva or so. So this, that earlier study that I talked about for uh, orientation of student leaders, I think it's something that needs to be sort of brought to the attention of academics that you have to think seriously about how you design the learning environment. There was no time for that. We just had to do it at the spare of the moment. So the support needed is to provide sort of uh, spaces, time and resources, it takes resources to be able to stop and do that. So when do you do it? Well, you're balancing that with a productivity for research, are you going to redesign your lessons so that they are flexible to be offered in any mode or so? We are anticipating another wave. Keep on talking about another wave. We're starting our full-time classes this week, starting on Thursday, no spacing, just wearing our masks and vaccination required for everybody. But we don't know, are we going to complete the semester? And if we don't complete it, what has been prepared by academics is for face-to-face -face teaching. How do we now take it back into the digital space and make it effective? So I think the major, major area is focus on designing learning and designing teaching that teaching digitally is not the same as standing in front of the class, taking cues from students, seeing all that, you just see squares and names and you don't see the reaction and how they're really uh, engaging in the classroom. Mm. So there's a lot of support for that beyond just how to use the technology. Mm. 
Yeah, and I can perhaps just add to that to reach out perhaps to the student affairs practitioners in your institution and see how you could, um, you know, refer easier perhaps and refer faster to the support services that people have on campus. Spot on. Mm -hmm. Deborah, I want to thank you very, very much for your time and preparing all of this and sharing your thoughts with us. Um, I want to also thank the other two speakers. Um, Professor Koresha Abdul Karim and Professor, Professor Linda Ronnie from UCT. Um, it's been an absolute joy having the three of you here this afternoon and listening to you and hearing um, your thoughts. Um, we will post the PowerPoint, um, as I said, the link on the on the chat. The links will go up um, in a mailer. Um, we will then also um, upload the recording into the YouTube channel. The links that were shared on the PowerPoint by Professor Mojo. Um, have been, we've searched for the correct one, see if that works for you. If not, please email me. Um, there is an evaluation link in the chat. We would like you to please complete it quickly if you can. It's very useful for us to shape the next engagements. I would like you all to quickly put your cameras on so that we can wave each, at each other as we say goodbye. I can see, um, yes, cameras are going on and it's just so much more kind of real to see a face that moves and that talks than um, just these um, avatars that we see. Oliver, is there a final word you want to share or can we close off? Uh, just from me, uh, this was really fantastic. Again, uh, number two of Engage Town and thanks so much. Uh, our deep, sincere appreciation to our amazing uh, speakers. Please give them a round of applause uh, for their fantastic contributions. And I think just setting the scene for, for further engagements. I think for us, uh, we've got our work cut out uh, in the sector. We've got our work cut out at USAF University of South Africa, and more specifically at Helm and supporting our academic leaders, uh, managers, our lecturers, and also the professional and administrative staff in our university. So it was really great having you all here today. We look forward to the next um, Helm Engage number three, which is on the 28th of uh, September. It's going to focus on student success. So we hope to see you all there. So thanks very much for joining us today. Have a fantastic uh, evening. Um, enjoy the rest of your week. And we look forward to, to hearing from you via our website or in other means. As Birgit says, if you would like to get more information, please feel free to, to email her directly. But we will provide you uh, with the access and the links to the recordings. Please share that with the documents that we share for you. Uh, with your colleagues, please feel free to do that. Over to you, Birgit, and then when we can say goodbye. Sure. Thank you. That's it. We're closing off, and goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. Take one. care. Bye-bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.